Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to one of our seminar house. Uh, today we will have uh, Rodrigo uh, Cesato that will be uh, presenting a, a paper he studied. Please, Rodrigo. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'll present you the sequential codelet model. It's a paper from the guys at the Delaware University. It is a, a super codelet model based on an hierarchical Turing machine. Uh, but let's go by steps. Uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to show a, a quote from Edward Lee in an article named The Problem with Threads. And it says, non-determinism should be explicitly added to programs and only where needed, as it is in sequential programming. So here's one, one problem with threads, right? That we add uh, un unwanted undeterminism to the to the program. As threads make programs absurdly non-deterministic and rely on programming style to constrain that non-determinism to achieve deterministic aims. So partially this happens because we're fitting parallelism into uh, abstractions that were made for sequential computing. So uh, one idea of this work is to present another program execution model that, that fits with parallel execution. So let's go to the, to the, pre the presentation itself. Uh, I will show the super code let model. First, I will uh, introduce the problem and give a, a, a more formal a motivation for this model. Then I will present the model itself, the sequential codelet model, and explain how uh, an hierarchical Turing machine works. Then I'll show a, a multi-level example that is a, a vector add program. It is multi-level because it runs on an hierarchical abstract machine, so it has many levels. And then I will explain how we can achieve parallelism in this hierarchical machine. And, and that's it. Then we have an overview of the, the presentation. Well, the, the context is well known. Uh, we need parallelism for performance uh, because we can expect a ship to scale in frequency uh, like it used to do. And also, uh, parallelism is available in commodity hardware more today than ever. So we have many systems that uh, have heterogeneous or we say core um, systems. And one thing is that those parallel computing systems, the, the, their design must achieve uh, these three things. Uh, a program running must have high system utilization and performance. So we want the, the program to utilize the available resources. We want the performance to be portable across systems and generations. So we want a program to work on different architectures and have good performance. And we must have programmability uh, because it, it also uh, reduces the time for a programmer to, to achieve a solution using the, the system. And we can achieve the, these three, three items with a, a well-defined high-level abstraction that is a, a program execution model. And this, this is not a, a programming model. It's an entire program execution model in the sense that it defines a computer organization and architecture, uh, how we can interact with the machine, it's like uh, the ISA that define the operations that we can use, defines what, is, what the program for the system is, how, uh, how it looks like, and all the interfaces that it has for a human to use the system, the compiler, runtimes, and so on. First, let's take a quick look at current abstractions, how, how computing infrastructure is defined today. So we have some, some models and abstractions that we use to, to build computers. So we started from the Turing machine and the, the von Neumann model. Uh, we have well-defined uh, components and well-defined interactions between these components. For example, the instruction set architectures. So let's look at this, uh, this component here, the, the hardware level. It has some interface for the, the systems to use, and namely the, the instruction set architecture. 
this is important because vendors can change the, the system if they respect the, the ISA, the, the remain of the infrastructure can stay the same. And this allows those components to, to evolve um, on their own and know how, how they can interact with the others um, as they, they change internally. And, and this allows us to have these many components. So we have programming languages, compilers, libraries, and so on. And the problem is that is uh, this is for sequential programming, right? What about a, a parallel programming program execution model for parallel system? Currently, there is no widely accepted, widely adopted uh, PXM model for parallel system. This leads to a, a disjoint evolution in hardware and software that, that is built for parallel programming, because as they, these models they they are they try to fit the the existing sequential infrastructure so given this the the, the proposal is the sequential codelet model the that is a, a parallel programming program execution model to define the sequential codelet model we will, we will revisit the Turing machine and the von Neumann model and we'll take a look at some uh, instruction level parallelism that allows us to today to, to, to have a parallel execution of sequential code and try to extend that idea to the whole computer, to the whole computing system. So our, our motivation. If we look at the uh, instruction set architecture, of uh, the hardware, it defines the machine operations, what the machine can do. And we must remember that uh, the operation support, this, a designer and architect will, will choose the, the operation support uh, based on a trade-off in the area. So we can support fancy instructions, but we will need more silicon to do so. Usually, general purpose processors have some basic arithmetic instructions like addition, subtraction, division, and so on. And some domain specific uh, processors may have some uh, instructions to perform the, the domain specific computation. So we can have trigonometric operations or FMAs like seeing this and so on. And in this model, we will think of of the programmer being able to add new operations to the arithmetic logic units. And to simplify, let's say that we have a five stage pipeline that we are used to. So a, a fetch, the code, memory, and write back uh, sequence in our pipeline. Uh, and we, when we are adding a new operation, we will keep the same uh, the sequence of the pipeline. But as we add fancy operations, we can model larger registers. And this will be more clear in the, in the following examples. Let's imagine a count instruction. So this is a somehow fancy instruction that will count the occurrences of a given integer in a given array. And it will count it in a, in a single cycle of that machine and, and store the result back in a, in a register. So this, for example, is our array. It contains 100 integers. And in total, it has 400 bytes. So it's a kind of large register. And the, the, the instruction count is as follow. We have some literal value that we're looking for. Uh, we have a register with the the entire array that we're going to to look for the occurrences of our value and we have an array to write back the result so here is an example of the this this instruction being used let's count the occurrences of the number 55 in a 300 byte array that which base is at this this position in memory and remember in this in this machine, each register can hold 100 uh, integers, so we cannot do it in only one step. 
So if we, let's look at these two first lines. First, we are loading the, the array into this register, but uh, our array is 300 bytes long, so we are only loading the first 100 bytes into this register. And then we are using the, the instruction count and, and saying, hey, count the occurrences of the number 55 in, in this register and save the results back in this another register here. And we do this three times. So uh, just a quick math here. So we are offsetting the base by 100 to, to take the next portion of the array, counting the occurrence of 55, and so on. And that's it, right? Uh, we do this three times and then accumulate the results on some register. So we are, are we are summing the the number of occurrences on the first portion with the second and accumulating the value here, and finally doing this for the last uh, portion of the array. So just a, a simple example of uh, the usage of uh, a somehow fancy instruction to count the occurrences of uh, a literal. And the question here is. Is this example parallel, right? I mean, I, I'm presenting you here as a sequential code that can be executed line by line. And but the point is, uh, it is sequentially written, but with some technologies, we can it can actually run in parallel. We have register renaming, out of order execution, or a super scalar processor. This this three blocks may actually execute in parallel, right? Uh, with a register renaming, we can eliminate these false dependencies on this register here. We can only save this on, on different registers, so we can, these operations can happen at the same time. And if you have sufficient units that can perform the, the count structure in parallel, they can likely occur at the same time. So yeah, this, this may be a, a may lead to parallel execution, even if it is sequentially written. OK, so this was a, a quick example. Let's define the sequential codelet model. The idea is that it tries to use the sequential program optimizations, like I show you in, the, in this brief example, like instruction level parallelism. Uh, to define it, we, we will redefine the Turing machine to try to achieve whole system parallelism with these optimizations. Uh, it extends the codelet model. And once again, a reminder, the sequential codelet model is not yet another programming model. It is an entire machine organization model. An implementation of this uh, model would require a hardware and software code design, including programming language, compilers, etc. So let's start with the universal Turing machine. So we have uh, an infinite storage tape that is divided in sections with um, symbols. We have a reading head that can go left and right through the, the tape. And we have uh, an state machine that is um, similar to a program, right? That will decide what to do at a given position of the tape. For a given state, we can move the head left or right, and we can print or raise uh, at the current tape position. I think I heard a message on, on it. No, no, it's it's nothing. Let's continue. Um, yes, yeah, okay. The the universal machine. I think we, you all know how how it works. So let's define the hierarchical Turing machine. It's actually Quite simple. We have a, a multi-level Turing machine, and we also have a state evaluation unit uh, at this machine. But the difference here is that the state evaluation unit is itself an hierarchical Turing machine. So we have this recursive definition. At a given level of this machine, uh, so let's say a level n, the state evaluation is a, a level n minus one, n minus one. Uh, hierarchical Turing machine. And it goes on until we reach the base of this recursion. And the base is uh, uh, a universal Turing machine that performs basic operations. So let's see in this image. Here we have the, at level n, this uh, 
infinite tape with symbols divided into section. We have a reading head. And let's say that at a given position, we're going to evaluate what you do uh, based on the symbol and in, based on our state. And to evaluate this state, we require a level n minus 1 hierarchical Turing machine that will also have uh, an internal state and infinite tape. And in, we will have, so let's say that this machine is at state S3. To evaluate what you do at this, this given state at this, with this given symbol, it requires a level n minus 2 uh, hierarchical Turing machine. So it's just this until we reach the base that is a, a, a traditional Turing machine. We can use the same uh, idea to extend the von Neumann architecture to the hierarchical von Neumann architecture. And it works uh, as follows. So the, the von Neumann architecture defines the, the processing unit with a control unit and uh, some arithmetic unit. Right, that interacts with uh, a memory of the system. To extend this model to a hierarchical one, we are just saying that this arithmetic unit is itself uh, another von Neumann model. And let's let's say that one operation that this machine performs is mapped to many simple operations that happen in this um uh, a level uh, level below uh, von Neumann model so one operation here can be executed as many simpler operations happening at this other uh, machine and like i said let's let's bring the the five stage pipeline to the hierarchical von Neumann architecture. So here we have, for example, three uh, a three-level IRACO machine that implements the sequential codelet model. And the pipeline, again, is a, an instruction fetch phase, instruction decode, an execution phase, a memory access phase, and finally, a write back. So let's go bottom to top. And if we see this, L0 machine, we can think of it as an ARM, RISC V, or x86 uh, architecture. And a program written for this level would look like some assembly code that we know. And the pipeline is works the way we expect it to do. Um, there we have the destruction memory here that will be fetched, decoded. We have this execution and this uh, arithmetic logic unit performs simply arithmetic operations and logic operations, some float point operations, and so on. And that's it. That's the architecture that we are used to. Uh, this higher level machine, L1, uh, has the same pipeline, but the, the execution stage of the pipeline happens in the machine at the level below. So when we are executing the instruction, the, 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 the instruction for this machine uh, is called a codelet. And the, this codelet executes on the machine level below. So it will, when we reach this stage in, in the pipeline, this machine actually waits for the machine at the level below to finish the execution. Uh, at this level, the ISA is not limited to arithmetic operations. We can have fancy instructions, like the count instruction, for example. We can also have bigger registers. And we have um, you know, more latency to access the memory here, because we have larger, larger banks. And we have uh, instructions that take longer, because they are more complex. And, but that's the way it is organized. And just to sum it up, uh, the execution stage at level 1 is offloaded to uh, to the level zero, right? So when when we decode the instruction, we go to execute it. Uh, it happens here, and also since the the operands for the the instructions here are the registers of this level, 
when L0 performs some store or some load into the memory, uh, the memory it's accessing, accessing is actually the registers from the level above. So, uh, so when we have the, the right backstage here, when we have the memory access here, it's actually interacting with the registers from the level Uh, sorry, my microphone turned off. Uh, okay. So the definition of the code let execution model is that a, a code let is basically an instruction that is used at some level n. And at, at some level n that is uh, greater than zero. The execution of this code let that is at level n happens at the level below, so n minus 1. One example of a code let could be a, a dot product uh, instruction, a count instruction. And code lets are stateless, meaning that they take the inputs and they produce a result. And that's it. There is no, no saved state. Uh, code lets are also no preemptive, meaning that their execution is atomic. They start executing and they go uh, they stay executing until they finish. And and codelet only starts executing when we have the the operands, just like a, a traditional instruction. And this definition can be used to model from a core on a ship at a, a low level to a whole computer cluster at a at some level, at some end that is big enough. And but we we'll talk about this later. We can even model clusters of clusters of of computers. And once again, a reminder that the sequential codelet model is not a programming model. It defines a whole machine organization behavior, and to implement it would mean to to design to co-design hardware and software, to define some machine programming interface, to have compilation technology for this, this model to define high level programming language and so on. It does not try to fit into the, the existing uh, sequential model. It's a new model entirely. So let's see an example of a program that can execute in this hierarchical abstract machine with many levels. And here we have a small example that we are going to translate to the to a hierarchical codelet abstract machine. Well, so let's set some some things. The programming interface is going to be similar to assembly level code. So what we're going to do is see how we can write machine code for this hierarchical machine. So it will look like assembly code. Uh, and remember that this does not mean that the the codelet model does not support high level constructs, right? It does, but to use them like classes and loop breaks, loop continues, we would require a compiler and well-defined languages. And that translation process, the this compilation technology is out of scope of this work. We're just going to see how machine code would look like for the the, the abstract hierarchical model. And here, this example that we will we will, we will manually translate to the to the code let abstract machine, it's written in C semantic, but think of it just as pseudocode. We have three uh, integers arrays of size 1000, and we are going to iterate over it and and sum the, the positions of A and B and save the result back to the array C. And the idea that will be mapped to different levels of hardware. So we, we have some uh, very fancy instruction that will, have at, that will happen at this level two hardware. And the execution of this instruction will happen at the level below. So here we have another code that operation that will happen, which execution will happen at the level below until we reach the end of the recursion. That is a, a low level ISA like MIPS. 
how can we write that simple vector summation in an hierarchical model? So here is a, a more well-defined pseudocode that translates to multiple levels. We'll go through its lines, but first let's just uh, set some conventions. Here we are assuming that the register size match uh, what we are expecting. That could not be the case, right? And that could be up to compilers technologies to work around some limitations of some specific architectures. Um, here, for simplification, we are just assuming that the, those registers of those different levels have the, the size that we're saying they have. We are using this function that I will read as address, and that is to use to find the address of the memory from the level above. So at a given level, we can use it to access the memory of the level, uh, of a higher level of the machine. We use this symbol to express literal values. We use the commit keyword to signal when the code let is done, right? When the instruction finishes executing. And we will uh, name registers using this notation. So the number written above is the machine level that we're talking about. And the register number itself is this subscription. So let's see this pseudo code. Here we have the, the integer arrays of size 1000. And we can think of uh, this level two program that we execute on a level two hardware. It contains registers of this size, you know, registers of size uh, 4000 bytes. And in a single instruction, we are going to perform this addition. So in a single instruction of this, this level two hardware, we are going to sum the, those elements from those arrays. And this instruction will execute at the level below and how it is uh, performed. So here we have the pseudocode that we execute on the level one hardware. That is the, the addition of those 1000 elements. At this level, our registers have size 100, so we cannot fit the entire uh, 1000 uh, elements array into one single register. So what we're going to do, we're going to iterate over and we're going to do 10 step of the sequence. We're going to load the 100 elements from this array into this register A1, load the 100 elements from the other array into register B, issue this instruction that sums 100 elements and saves back into register C, and then store back into memory the, the results of those first 100 steps. We are going to do this uh, 10 times. And for each iteration here, we are going to issue this instruction that happens at, that happens at the level below, so at level zero, that is this, the addition of these 100 elements. So let's see how this goes. And here we have uh, the addition. And let's say that at this uh, level zero hardware, we can only, our registers can only fit one integer at a time. So we receive as parameters the, the address of the, the array, the, the registers from the level above that contains 100 elements. So we're going to iterate 100 times. And for each iteration, we're going to load the value to a register from the array, uh, perform the arithmetic operation, the, the, the summation, and then store the value back to C. And we do this 100 times. So this is how the 100 elements addition happens at level zero. So level zero is, uh, has only simple instructions. We're only doing some uh, simple addition here. And we can think of this level as some MIPS architecture. And, but let's see the machine code for each one of them. So first at the higher level uh, the, of the abstract machine, we have the, this code. And here we have some comments. So this registers contains A, and it's a very large register that contains A entirely. 
uh, this register contains B, and this register contains C that will later hold our result. And let's assume that A and B are already initialized at this point. What will happen is that at, uh, we start executing our code, and eventually line seven will be fetched and decoded. So here's line seven. And when we reach line seven, we are passing as parameters to as operands of this instruction to to perform the 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 addition. And when we reach this point, uh, L two will wait for the code let execution. We'll, we will, we will be waiting for this instruction to finish. And this instruction will be actually executed on level one hardware. So let's see how it goes. So, okay, let's go slowly through this code. So here at level one, we have uh, smaller registers. So we have only 400 bytes for each register. And we are going to use, so we have a register for A and B and a register for the result. And we have a register that we're going to use as a iteration variable because they're going to loop through the through the addresses to sum the whole vector. So when this L1 code starts execute, we start executing the this codelet. At line eight, we are going to initialize the iteration variable. And here we have the, our loop. So here we have some simple assembly-like code. We have a branch if equal to uh, exit the loop when we we reach the last uh, iteration. And for each iteration, we will load a portion of the array into our registers. So this is the function that uh, access the registers from, from the level above with a given offset. And we are using the iteration variable as the offset here. So at each step, we are taking, we are advancing 400 bytes here in this address that we are accessing. Saving, loading this this value into the registers of our level one machine, performing some uh, this instruction that is a codelet that sums 100 elements or 400 bytes. And we store the, the value back at the, the memory, which is the register from the level above. We advance our iteration variable and then uh, go back to the to the beginning of the loop until we contemplate all the, the positions. Uh, it's important to note here that uh, on line 14, we have a, an L0 codelet that will happen at that means that when we are going to execute the execution unit of L1 reaches this point, we are going to offload the computation to a L0 machine. And at this point, the L1 machine just waits for L0 to finish the operation. And at each iteration, we are going to, to execute this instruction on L0. So let's take a look at how this addition executes on the L0 hardware. And here, the the L0 code is written as MIPS, just to, to show how it can be used as a base architecture to run this model. And if any of you is not familiar with MIPS, I have written some of the opcodes definitions here and some informations. So just let's just quickly take a look. Uh, the register zero uh, always contains the value zero. We cannot write any value uh, back to it. It's always zero. Uh, this opcode means set one if less than, and we have the operands. SLL is a logical shift left. Uh, branch if not equal, multiply instruction. Uh, these registers contain the, uh, the this is opcode uh, loads the, the value from the LO register into a given register that is given as an operand. And this LO register contains the least significant bits of a multiplication. 
since uh, multiplication can exceed the 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 word size, it is split into two registers, and this one is the one that contains the the least significant bits. Uh, we do not have to go through the entire code, but the idea is that we're going to iterate over the our array, then from each element from A and B, and here we're going to iterate over 100 elements. So we're going to go through this loop 100 times. Uh, since this is MIPS, each each load that we perform only loads uh, four bytes, meaning that we're going uh, an integer at a time. So just just doing a quick overview of it, we have an iteration variable that we use to offset the address that we're loading. We are performing an, an unsigned addition. So we are loading the, the value from from the position that we're looking at the array, loading from the other array and saving the 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 results back to to see. And that's it. We're going to do this for the, the entire array. We can we can go this into this in detail if someone wants wants in the end. But the idea is that we're going to iterate over every element of those arrays and save the result back to C. And the commit keyword signalizes that the execution is done. Uh, okay, so when this code let finishes, uh, the machine uh, machine level L1 enters the write back stage, right? Because this means that we finished the, the execution stage of it. So yeah, this is a nice sequential program, but where is the parallelism, right? It's just a hierarchical sequential code executed. And remember that we, uh, we were talking about a five stage pipeline to introduce a structural level parallelism at each level of the machine. And the argument here is that we can have super scalar architectures, like we can have, uh, we can see multi-core systems as L1 execution units. We can see multi-socket systems as many L2 execution units. Uh, and we can have all those optimizations from the structural level parallelism technologies. We can have a register renaming, so uh, this could lead us to execute our vector addition example in parallel. So those L0 code that could be executed in parallel, so given that we have many execution units for the uh, for that codelet. We can even have some out of order execution engine and have runtime dependencies, uh, runtime detection of data dependencies and reorder instructions to utilize. Uh, those this pool of uh, execution units we can even go as far as to have ex speculative execution at any given level of this abstract machine and um, but the paper does does not go into detail of how this could be implemented and we cannot think of how the hardware could fit this uh, hierarchical abstract machine and there are actually many architectures that can compose it uh, it's uh, its definition is really can really accept those at heterogeneous systems that we have today. So let's think of the execution units of a given level that run some specific codelet. We can have different execution uh, machines for those codelets. We can use TPUs for AI related codelets. We can use GPUs for codelets that look like some single program multiple threads model. We can even have FPGA implementations that are made to execute some specific codelets. And we can um, assign the execution to these available systems, execution units at runtime. And this hierarchical organization can even be used to extend beyond a, a single core. So our example went to from a single core to a multi-core and then to multi socket on a at the higher level of the machine. But we can even go further up. So let's think of a whole heterogeneous cluster, even a cluster of clusters, right? We can have so let's look at the picture first. We can have at level zero some CPU cores that execute some uh, MIPS-like uh, assembly code. And at level one, we can have uh, an entire socket that contains many cores as execution units. 
we can have nodes that contain many sockets. We can have clusters that contains many nodes, and we can have a, a cloud that contains many clusters. And we can think, hey, but what about the the memory cost of accessing memory across clusters? Yeah, the the memory latency does go up as we go at higher uh, machine levels, but at those higher levels. Uh, besides having more access latency, we also have bigger memory. Sorry, my, my mic turned off again. Uh, but okay, at, at those higher levels, we have bigger memory and we are expected to perform some slower and more complex operations, right? So the, the code let's execute in here are more complex. So there's a trade-off in memory access and complexity of the, the operation. And from this idea, we can even have, uh, we can even use current compiler technology, use compiler uh, optimizations for instruction scheduling. And we, we, and we can use this at any given uh, abstract machine level. We just have to treat those codelets as some ISA operations. And Extended in current technologies, we can even have compilers that merge some codelets if it makes sense. And just to give a, a brief example, uh, a compiler can replace a multiplication followed by an addition by an instruction that performs the multiplication and the addition in a in a single step. So we can go as far as to have compiler technology that can merge codelets that when the when it makes sense to do so. And that's it. The, the this presentation was about the sequential codelet model. We showed the, the hierarchical Turing machine, the hierarchical von Neumann model, then the abstracted codelet machine that has many uh, execution levels. We then showed how a vector addition can execute in, in, this, in this machine, how we can exploit instruction level parallelism to have parallel execution in the sequential codelet model. And, and then talked about some possible improvements that can be made to the to a sequential codelet model program, how it can be improved by compiler technologies and so on. And that's it. Thank you for attention so far. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Any question? Yes, Sona. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for the presentation. Um, this was a, a very interesting paper, kind of out of the box, let, let me say it like that. But uh, <clears throat> let me see if I got it straight, especially the final, the, the, the final slides that you, you showed me got me a little bit confused. So when you say, that you can have uh, cloud clusters, etc. Can you can you show that picture again, please? First, this one. So, are they assuming that some of the levels are not really harder, maybe softer? Is that? Mm. Because I, I, uh, how can I, I don't know. I, I, um, there is a lot of abstraction here to digest, and it's difficult for me to really understand what these guys are, are trying to do. Uh, because if you consider executing a cluster, uh, like a harder instruction for someone in the level above, right? Is that the idea, right? Yeah, that's the idea. But the actual execution in a cluster will involve software. You have the, the operating system, the nodes, and etc. So we we are not the HVM is not pure harder. That's the idea that that I had when you you showed this picture. But I'm not sure if I got it correct. Yeah, I, I think I think I understand the the question here. And yes, it's really strange to think as I don't know of a five stage pipeline happening at a cloud level, for example, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, a agglomeration of clusters doing some fetch of a really fancy instruction and then the code in this really fancy instruction and then delivering the 
I don't know, splitting it in, into many execution units that are clusters that are going to decode this instruction and so on. So yeah, that's a it's a really complex and nested abstraction. And as far as I uh, I understand it from the paper, they don't go into details here, but they do say that uh, as they expand it to encompass more architectures and more and larger systems, it will implicate in the development of our, of runtime systems and, and those technologies. They don't describe how it could be done, but I think that the, that implicates that we're going to have some runtime systems to coordinate these and, and deal with the execution. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the, uh, the name that they use is uh, uh, hierarchical, how, how is the name again? HVM, right? It's a, a hierarchical abstract machine. A hierarchical abstract machine. So one hierarchical abstract machine it is, is not really pure, pure hardware. You have like a whole stack maybe inside of one, one machine there. That's what I'm getting from this picture. Uh, OK, because I can, I can understand the abstract concept of pipeline here, but we are not talking about uh, a hardware pipeline anymore. It's like something bigger. <laughs> yes. OK. So uh, come back to the, the, that uh, example with the vector, vector multiplication, right? Uh, you, we have L2, L1, and L0, right? Yes. So the idea is that the 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 programmer that's coding for this machine would write something like in level two, and everything everything else below that would be like handled by the HVM with compilers or whatever. But the user, the programmer, would only see what is needed to program. In, at the level L2, right? Yes. For what I got from the the paper is that this um, well, this is a, a very low level code. Let's say right that we're dealing with the registers directly here. Even if we have uh, some really big registers. At yeah. And actually, the the program would see something even higher level than L2, right? L2 would be the compiled code for for the program. Exactly. So this is implicated we're going to have a, a whole infrastructure of, uh, I don't know, not only programming languages and compilers, but I don't know, programming conventions to that will lead to this code. Yeah. And, and we have support from the hardware, right, for, for this. Yeah, so, so at this point here, I was trying to understand how the, those guys would put everything below L2 in hardware. But now when you, you showed the cloud and et cetera example, I understood that they are not thinking about that. Uh, yes, okay. that's out of, I think that's out of scope of this work. They only presented the, the model and how it would execute code and use instruction level parallelism to try to. to yeah, actually this example you can do with the technology we have today, right? Uh, it's. It's a yes. different organization, but you 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 can like combine your compilers and processors uh, and etc to make this happen. I, I see someone building a simulator or something like that for for this HVM with this example here. Uh, I, I can see that now that I I know that I can mix software in the in the middle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. I, I was trying to better understand because it's like a lot to digest here and like I said it's really out of the box the the way they think about the, the architecture and thanks thank you very thank you thank for the question uh so maybe what just one comment just to uh complement what uh, sandro says said uh if you if you have this kind of software under some higher level instruction uh, it would mean uh, that those instruction does not have uh, it, it would be very difficult to predict uh, the, the latency of your higher level instruction right mm, yes well to be fair at some point in the paper the authors do say that they are assuming for simplicity that those all these 
fancy instructions that they are suggesting will not affect the latency. It will stay roughly the same, and it will not have to uh, it does not implicate any changes in the pipeline. So let's assume everything stays the same, including the latency and including the, yeah, the but it, pipeline. But I don't know how how much of it is actually feasible when yeah, you go to actual will, hardware. Yeah, if you go if you go uh, for a, a cluster instruction, it seems a bit. Uh, a big assumption to to think that uh, or or instruction uh, uh, with fixed latency. But uh, anyway, okay. I think you need to to get some assumption at some point. Um, but in terms of programming, so this would mean that uh, we don't need to do parallel programming anymore, right? We just need to split uh, the work in in several uh, i don't know if this is what they call codlet but several tasks basically mm, yes the idea is to write sequential code which will then execute in parallel just like we have with sequential code on single cores today that we have you know we can have um, multiple additions happening in a single clock uh, cycle but th does it mean that uh, we would need to uh, design languages to only have uh, those higher level uh, instruction? And if so, how would we uh, do the translation? Is it something that we uh, we would have like uh, hierarchical uh, uh, compilers that would uh, expand each of those instructions and then compile again the, the, the program, something like this. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, and I also have some some of these practical doubts about the how it would be implemented. The authors do say that the this translation process, how the how we will build a compiler that emit code for those many levels, what we would we do if we don't have uh, some particular uh, hardware to execute some particular instruction that we have not defined how to run on some the available hardware and they don't go into details about it. And to be honest, I don't know how we would uh, implement it. How can we, uh, we meet uh, this what I understood is that it's exactly what we are saying. We need what what they are trying to do here is is kind of uh, take out of the burden of parallel program from the user. Right, the user says, "I want to multiply two big arrays," and you, every everything else is made under the hood. So you, you need a compiler to translate from L from the program to L2, another compiler from L2 to L1, and another compiler from L1 to L0, for example, <laughs> to make yeah. this this sample work. I don't I don't see how it would work other way. It would be a, a new a new hierarchy in the compiler. You yeah, not not yeah. only compilers because. The motivation of the paper was, oh, programming with threads is very cumbersome or something like that. OK, but the programming with threads is hidden from the, the user, but it's under the hood, right? How would you do the, the all the parallel stuff in L0 or L1 if you don't use multiple threads or if you don't use the multiple cores? Yeah, the, I, I think the, the main point of the author is to use the same uh, technology, technologies from instruction level parallelism. Yeah, they, so it, if they want to execute this model in the same hardware we have today, all the parallel stuff is going to be hidden under the hood, but it would be there. But it would be needed to do like automatically. The compiler, you need to, to be able to generate all the, the, the tasks or threads or whatever you decide to do uh, mm -hmm. without the help from the programmer. The application program. That's yeah, but not, not necessarily because if you if you change the hardware, you could have uh, uh, like the instructions uh, scheduling uh, phase that would happen for the course, for example. So you don't need uh, you don't need threads anymore. You just uh, assign tasks uh, to each of your cores, something like this. 
But how will you get the most of the performance from the current processors without really using threads? Yeah, you would you would have to change a bit of the architecture. Yeah, yeah, but uh, on the commodities harder today. <laughs> I don't know. Of course, they are not trying to just do the commodity rider today. This is a paper, like exploratory paper, OK? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of the hierarchy, but the, the software stack to, to really provide this is not simple to, to build. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the idea is really to, to implement this and have the this level of parallelism that they they are trying to sell, that means restructuring the the entire stack that we have from the hardware to the to the software, the frameworks that we have. Uh, everything would be updated somehow. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's a lot to digest. I don't know if I'm I'm seeing all the details here, but. They do they mention that they are trying to do some kind of simulator or something like that that would show us how this stuff all this stuff would work or it's just a for now it's just a proposal like a theoretical proposal something like that it's just a proposal there, there's no I don't know numerical result or estimation of performance it's just this this model mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other question? No? Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Rodrigo for the presentation. And I'm going to stop uh, recording.